this uh, new year as 2017. The promise for this year is to be thankfulness towards God and thankfulness towards other people. As Colossians 3.15 it says, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which also you were called in one body and be thankful. We have been commanded to be thankful towards God and to others. As I was sharing in this uh, morning Tamil service, they did a, a scientific study about the people who are thankful who are not thankful. They took about 300 people and they divided into three groups. One group, they gave a journal that every day you be thankful for something and you write down and then you verbalize wherever it is possible. And then they took another group of people, hundred of them, and then they gave the notebook and then they asked them to write down what the problem or the things which has gone wrong, which you can see from your life and others' life every day. And the third group, they gave them the notebook you write whatever you are thinking. They studied over 10 years and then they measured their happiness level. The third group, whatever they wanted to write, whatever they did, they were only happy up to 14% of their time. Their happiness was only 14% of the time. The people who looked at others or the fault of themselves on the others, they were happy only 4% of their time. Over 10 years, it's not one year, two years, 10 years they have done this exercise. But the first group, they were happy almost 84% of the time. It's scientifically proven that when you have the attitude of gratitude, you are bound to be happy. How many of us are very happy about something? How many of us are thankful about something? Did you thank God for this day today, as you woke up, as you went around, did everything, were you thankful that you are able to breathe, you are able to walk, you are able to do so many menial things? We take it granted. But instead of we being thankful, we are quick to point out the problems or the complaints about the others. That's a very well-known joke. Let me share this. You know, there's a guy who was uh, sulking and walking around. And the friend of him asked him, what happened? Why are you so unhappy? He said, you know what happened three months back? I never knew I had an aunt. But this aunt has passed away. And she had got some inheritance which she had written to me. I got 100,000 pounds through her. He said, you must be happy. You, without anything, you got 100,000 pounds. He said, listen to me, two months back, I knew I had a great grandfather whom I never met, but this guy is dead and gone. And he had written a will that I got 250,000 pounds from that. He said, then you must be very, very happy, man. What's the problem? You don't know what happened last month. There was supposed to be an uncle whom I knew, but we were not in touch. He had taken a very big insurance policy and he put me as a nominee and he suddenly died. I had inherited about half a million pounds. He said, wow, that's wonderful. Then why are you so upset? He said, this is the fourth month. Today is 30th and nothing has happened this month. Aren't we like that? You know, we receive so many things from the Lord on so many occasions, so many things. But yet we end up crying about what we haven't got, but we are not thankful about what we have got. Most of them, most of us, we all do that. And in the Christian circle, we call this as a prayer. In a religious terms, we call this as a prayer. In a family setup, if a wife wants to give an advice to a husband, what does she do? She will start praying. God, you know, 
my husband is little angry, he is always quick to do things, give him the wisdom lot. You know, whatever you want to tell him, you call that as a prayer and you tell God. <coughs> when you want to pray for your children, you want to say something to your children, what do they do? What do your parents do? They will tell God, God, you know, last month he went, he lost his phone, he also, she also broke the phone, she also did this one, but you know, give her the wisdom, give her the wisdom for this guy so that he will be careful. That you tell your children, don't they say that as a prayer. You know, we, we do that. Because we are very good in picking up what is wrong with the other person rather than looking at something and appreciating the things. Because it has crept into our society so much in our normal life, we also have the same attitude towards God as well. When you are, how you are in your everyday, day-to-day -day life, how you are doing it, that's how you also end up reflecting or connecting with God the similar way. Imagine like, you know, I know we are going to have a pizza after the service. So, imagine um, you don't get to choose, I get to give you. So, I give you first, uh, you know, cheese one. So, you have taken a couple of cheese pizza and then you started eating. Then I take the pepperoni and I give it to this next person who is sitting next to you. He will think, oh dear. Initially, when you got two pieces, you were very happy because the, the guy who is sitting next to you never got anything. But then when he gets a pepperoni, you wanted to have that one. It always happens, you know. When you, you end up looking at somebody else's, oh, that one is nice. I like this one. I like that one. Because we are not thankful about what we have got and rather we become very good in complaining that. As you all know, the advertising industry works on only one line. What? What you have got is not best. What we have got is the best. But the Bible commands us to be thankful always. As this year is a uh, year of uh, thankfulness, let me read this verse from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Verse 16 it says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. In Everything. Maybe when you get a good grades, you can say, wow, praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I want to praise God. I passed out in a good marks. Or when you have got some job, you can say, praise the Lord. I have got, uh, you know, good job. So I want to praise God for it. Or maybe when you have got some, you know, very good uh, results or you got a house, you got a car, maybe you can celebrate it. But when you go through difficulty, do you come and say, hey, praise God, you know, I'm going through heartache. Praise God, you know, I lost my baby. Praise God, I lost my husband. Praise God, I lost my wife. You know, do you come and say that? No. But the Bible says, in everything, give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. God's will about your life is explicitly told here that you are to thank God for everything. Can you thank God for everything? For all the problems or all the difficulties or whatever you are going through or what you went through? It is tough, right? How can I thank God for it? You know, because it pains. It, it really pains me. Because we all the time cry. We call that as a prayer also, most of the time. You know, we can't even speak, we can't even share and then we start crying. But we don't understand that this is the will of God that we ought to thank God for everything. How can you thank God for everything? Is it possible? Yes, of course it is possible. The Bible commands us very clearly that you are to be thankful for everything. Everything. Whether it is smaller one or a big one, whatever it may be. Or maybe it is um, the failures or the problems. In all those things, God can work and if we are thankful towards him. 
the very people god has put in your life the very say, the place where god has kept you in your job or in your college or in your school or in your workplace or in your home everywhere you ought to be thankful towards god one good example i can take from the scripture in the old testament today i will take somebody that is joseph if you turn with me in genesis chapter 37 from genesis 37 to genesis 50 it talks about the life of joseph in chapter 37 verse 2 when joseph was 17 years old he was tending the flock with his brothers and verse 3 it says that joseph father israel now israel loved joseph the more than all his children because he was the son of his old age also he made him a tunic of many colors in the olden days when they wear a uh, dress looking at their dress you can identify who they are the uniform the existence of uniform came only through that like if you see a policeman looking at their uniform you know he is a policeman looking at a doctor's coat you know he is a doctor a lawyer they got a specific this is how they used to wear it in the olden days when they wear a uh, when you look at them what kind of a tunic they are wearing then you will know what kind of a person they are so if he is wearing a, a tunic of many colors because those days you know uh, the making a, a garment out of many colors is a very expensive one so that means he is a royalty he is from a rich family he is being mo- mostly loud like so he is um, wearing a tunic of many colors and his father loved joseph more than all of his brothers verse 4 but when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him when the father loved him all his brothers a uh, ten of them they were totally hated him more and not only that in verse 5 it says joseph had a dream and he told it his brothers they hated him even more so when he tell about his dream they are hate, hating him so much so much means so much and they were tending the sheep and his father wants to send joseph with the food so he calls out to him in chapter 37 and verse 13 it says and israel said to joseph are not your brothers feeding the flock in sekem come i will send you to them so he said to him here i am i really like this his father calls him and tells him your brothers are in sekem and they are taking care of the sheep would you please go give food to your brothers he says yes here i am i go but these days we find it very difficult for the children to obey their parents and also i want to tell you something more if we ask you to do something which is very important then you will come and you will do it very gladly and you will respect that like uh, today martina came and shared the word so if i had asked you or someone has asked you to come and share you know before the uh, message i will be want you to come and share you will say okay you wear now nice clothes you will go pray put all makeup and everything you will come and you will do if the same guy comes and tells you today could you make the tea please would you come prepared that way oh i have to make tea so i have to wear a nice dress i have to put my makeup you know i'm going to prepare a tea no you don't but you will always find in the bible when they were doing a menial regular thing that's when they found god given purpose and the destiny in their life joseph went to give food to his brothers that's where he was sold as a slave he was put into the pit and then he taken from the pit and he was sold as a slave and then he reached his destiny saul 
before becoming a king his father told him son one of our donkey is missing so go search for it he took a servant and he went for to searching for the donkey finally his father has to look for saul he went into the job so much and then he end up meeting the prophet samuel and then he became a king david he was tending his sheep the father's sheep in the forest when the prophet comes to his father's home his father didn't even bother to call him but he was taking care of the sheep so you will find always people walk into their god given purposes when they are doing the normal ordinary job it is nothing to do with spiritual giving brothers uh, food for their brothers is not a spiritual thing it's not a big job it's not a very uh, important job but whatever god has put in your hand whatever it may be you do it sincerely and faithfully then you will end up reaching your destiny it doesn't matter what what kind of a job you do either in your workplace or in the church wherever you are be faithful in what god has called you to do when you do it gladly and faithfully then you will do that so joseph goes after his brothers in shechem he couldn't find and then he goes to a place called datham and then he founds them as soon as he reaches them in verse 18 chapter genesis 37 verse 18 it says now when they saw him afar off even before he came near them they conspired against him to kill him they are seeing him far off joseph is coming here comes the dreamer they call that also let's see how his dream will come to pass we will kill him but he is bringing food for them and what they are thinking let's kill him and then what do they do they put him in the pit and then ruben says no no like what is the point and then judah pulls him out and then they sold him as a slave in verse um, 35 and 36 and all his sons and all his daughters arose to comfort and verse 36 it says now the midianites had sold him in egypt to pathiver an officer of pharaoh and a captain of the god so they sold him to pharaoh as a slave selling a slave and buying a slave is done in the market how you buy vegetables or cattle or sheep i don't know how many of you have seen um, you know buying in the market cattle or sheep anyone here no you, you guys didn't get a chance uh, so i grew up in a village we always have the weekly market and in the weekly market they will bring all the cow and all the sheep and everything so they go and then they inspect the cow and the sheep and they will uh, you know make the cow to open its mouth and then they will count the teeth through that they will know how ma- how old it is and how many time it has uh, e- given birth to the thing everything they know by look you know by counting the teeth and looking at it they will know okay this is what it is they inspect and then only they will buy in th- this time also when they were buying slaves what they do is they will ask the slave to stay naked except a, a little loin cloth the reason is they believed if you have got any skin disease which is uncurable and also which is contagious so they don't want anyone to have any skin disease so what they do is they will ask you to almost stand as a naked and then with a stick they will make you to turn around and see they will inspect you is is there any mark on your skin is your skin is clear or something like that you see where he was he was wearing a tunic of many colors and he was loved by his father more than anyone else and he when all his brothers were tending the sheep he was at home now he is sitting in the marketplace and naked as a slave see what kind of a demotion what kind of a problem he has gone through and in chapter 39 we find he is in pathibas house 
and Pathiva's wife's eyes on him and she is asking him to lie down with him but he refuses and he runs away and she accuses him of adultery and then he was put in the prison. So he goes to the prison. He is in the prison and he, the prison is, he, when he is in the prison, the prison uh, guard hand over the prison to him and he is taking care of the prison. When he was in the Pathiva's house, he is taking care of Pathiva's house. When he is in the prison, he is taking care of the prison. And there two prisoners come and one of the guy is going to be released, another guy is going to be killed. The one of the guy who is going to be released is the one who is the cup bearer to the king. The cup bearer is a very important role in those days. What do they do is, before they give any food to the king, this guy will eat first. It's not, it's a very privileged position, but it's a very dangerous position. You know, the reason is, you get to eat all the king's delicacies just to see is there a poison in it or not. So, you eat and if you don't die, then the king will eat. So, he always travels with the king and he gets to eat all the king's delicacies and king looks at him and he has got such a good position and he goes into Pharaoh's house and he has been reinstated his position but he forgets about Joseph for next two full years. In chapter 40, verse 23, 22 and 23, but he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted them, yet the chief butler did remember Joseph but forgot him. Then it came to pass at the end of two full years. So from the time he left from father's house to Sekam until he comes to Pharaoh's palace, it took about 13 long years. 13 years. So, I want you to imagine how you would have walked around for the 13 years. It's tough, right? You have been sold as a slave, you have been accused of what you have not done and you have been put in the prison and you are inside the prison, you help somebody, still you don't get released and you are inside the prison, how you would have cried, how you would have run a pity party for you, how much you would have told every one of them. If you were in the prison, at least everybody would have known your story, how your father was, how, what kind of a cloth you were wearing, how you lived in your hometown, you know, all those stories you must have told and what you did not do, what you did. But you study the scripture carefully. Joseph never ever complained. Joseph never ever defended that he is innocent. He never ever cried, God, are you there or not? God, are you hearing my prayer or not? But he was thankful. He was joyful. But when his brothers come to buy the food, in Genesis chapter 45, he first he is making himself known to his brothers that it is him. The guys who has sold them as a slave, they come and they stand before him. Now the roles are reversed and he is the prime minister of Egypt and he holds such a big position. Let me read this then you will understand. In Genesis chapter 45 verses 1 and 2, then Joseph could not restrain himself before all those who stood by him and he cried out, make everyone go out from me. So no one stood with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard it. I, I really think about this. If somebody, if my brothers are done and I am the prime minister of Egypt, and if they come standing there right in front of me begging for food, what I would have done? First, everyone 
give them some beatings. Come on. Hey, you only told me now to put in the pit, first you come. Come on, gods, beat them up. Maybe you won't, you know, you are all looking very holy, like, you know, no, 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 that is wrong, like, I would, I don't know how we all would have reacted it. Because it's not easy. But he saw very differently and he is crying for his brothers and his cry is sound the way he cried. Even the Egyptians heard, the Pharaoh who was in the palace, who could hear? And all these brothers were that they were terrified of him because he can do anything, they all can be killed. But what did Joseph say? Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. And then verse 4 it says, And Joseph said to his brothers, Please come near to me. So they came near. Then he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now, do not therefore be grieved and angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. He saw it is God's plan. It is God who sent him. That is why he did not upset with his brothers. He did not have anything. He said, don't worry, do not grieve. It is God who sent me in advance. And he looked after them and 70 of them came and they stayed. And final remarks when he is about to die in Genesis 50 verses 19 and 20. It, this is his final remarks before his death. He tells his brothers and everyone. Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. What you did is evil. You did evil. But God. Life is not fair. But God. The problem in your life is real. But God. The pain may be real. But God. You got to get this correctly. Otherwise, we will not get the right perspective about our life. Joseph had this attitude. That's why he said, you meant evil, it's okay, but God turned that into good. God can make all things work together for good. So, we are, I'm not worried about it. That is one of the reasons why Joseph was always able to be thankful and happy and he was able to live his life. This one attribute we need to learn from him. When Joseph and his brothers, 70 of them settled. They grew up to 3 million people. Then later on, God sent Moses to deliver them from Egypt as a slaves to come into the promised land of Canaan. The Israelites, when they got out of Egypt, God brought them with mighty miracles. They were brought into the promised land. From Egypt to Canaan, it should take only 11 days journey, just 11 days journey, but whereas they took 40 long years. Why? 40 long years, not one year, two years, 40 years. It should have been only 11 days journey maximum. Because God who chose them, God said, I will deliver them. And God sent Moses and he prepared and he brought forth a mighty miracle. There were ten plagues and the last one was the Passover. And all the firstborn Egypt was got killed. And then they came, they came to the Red Sea. The Red Sea parted. It's an amazing miracle. A wonderful miracle. When the Egyptian army tried to pass through, they were drowned in that Red Sea. Amazing. But yet, they could not reach. Why? 
the New Testament gives you a wonderful example now. Let me read from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It says, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them and that the rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. So it says, they all ate the same spiritual food. They did everything same. Like how you and me being baptized by water and the spirit. The same way they were also baptized by water and the spirit. And they followed the rock. The rock was Christ. They drank the drink from the rock. That is not none other than Jesus Christ. Yet their bodies were scattered and they were dead in the wilderness. Why? Verse 6 it says, Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And then it goes on to the list. And then verse it says, verse 10, Nor complain as some of them also complain and they were destroyed by the destroyer. They were murmuring. They were only murmuring and complaining. They came before the Red Sea. You will see in chapter 14, Exodus chapter 14. When they come, there are two mountains and they see Red Sea in the front. They started crying, Moses, are there not any grave in Egypt? You brought us into this wilderness to die. And then God did an amazing miracle. They pass through the Red Sea. They come to the other side. Now they come to a place called Mara. There is no drinking water. What do they do? Immediately they ask, Moses, are there not any, any grave in Egypt? You brought us to the wilderness. What kind of a God you have brought? Now we don't have a drinking water. We have a problem. They All the time, you look at each and every time. They received a food called manna. And it is the food angels ate. That's what the scripture says. And God gave them the supply. What did they complain? Oh, how we were eating in Egypt. Remember the garlic we ate in Egypt. What? Garlic. The cucumber. In Egypt. In the wilderness, they were sitting, they were eating God's food, God's supply. It's supernaturally appearing every day. Amazing miracles, but yet they always complain about it. So either you can be thankful or you can be complaining. You can't be in between. Either you are thankful to God or you are a complainer. You won't be in both. Or you may be mood swinger. One day complaining, one day thanking. One day complaining, one day thanking. Or morning complaining, evening thanking. Evening complaining, morning thanking. Maybe you are doing that, this and that like a, tossed by the waves. He says, Nor complain, as some of them also complained and they were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things have happened to them as examples. Hello, it says it's all happened to them as example to us. As you all studied, when you study a maths class, I don't know how many of you like maths lesson, I don't know. <laughs> they always have one example first, how to do. So they would have worked out how it is to be done and then they will give the next set of the lesson. So here God is saying, I have given you example in the Old Testament. What is the example? The Israelites, they left. How many of them? 600,000 men left from Egypt to go to the land of Canaan. And how many people entered? Only two people entered. Joshua and Caleb. The rest, everyone got killed in the wilderness. So here he says, Now all these things happened to them as examples. And they were written for our admonition, 
upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So, there is a serious consequences if you are complaining. I am not here to threaten you. I am not forcing you to be thankful. I am telling you the consequences of complaining, the consequences of thankfulness. If you are thankful, you are going to be happy and you are going to live a happy life. If you are going to complain, you know what will happen. What happened to the Israelites, they were walking in the wilderness and you will also be walking around in the wilderness throughout your life. You won't be happy. You won't be happy and you won't make others happy. So are you a complainer or are you are a thankful person? Here it says very clearly, they were not able to be happy, they were complaining and they were destroyed by the destroyer. So how do we live our life? Are we, if we have to live thankfulness, we have to live happily, how are we going to live practically in our life? Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ, no longer I live, but Christ lives in me. So first of all, this life what we have got, we have received from the Lord. The eternal life we have got, we have received from the Lord. That I have been crucified with Christ and no longer I love, but Christ lives in me. To understand this, you understand the life of Lazarus. Okay, in John chapter 11, we know the story very well. Lazarus is being dead. After four days, Jesus comes and then he brings him back to life. Okay. Just for a moment, imagine you are Lazarus. Okay. Just, just for a few minutes, imagine you are Lazarus. And you were dead. And you have been buried. Fourth day, when all everything is decaying, Jesus comes and you come back alive. Now, how will you live? For a moment you think. If you were Lazarus, you were dead, on the fourth day you come back alive. Now, will you scared of your life? Oh, I know what is death. I have already been dead. So what you can do? Do whatever you want. That's why you will see in John chapter 11 afterwards, the Jews were conspiring to kill Lazarus again. Because many people were putting their faith in Lazarus. Last week I met a guy who was in the prison. Um, because of some visa problems. So we've been praying and uh, miraculously God intervened and he did not be, he was not deported and he has, they have been let him go and he has come back. I met him in the high street when I uh, went for a walk in the afternoon. When I met him, he was telling me, this life God has given me and I have to do something for him. He had a track in his hand. He said, I am looking for people so that I can share the gospel. I can share about God to others. Because I am not going to rest. I know this God is real. He is a living God. So I want to do something for the Lord. Why you and me don't take that kind of a seriousness? Why you take it so easy? Ah, it's okay. Jesus came. Yeah. Jesus died. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus rose again. Yeah. Jesus is yes. Yeah, yeah. I'm a Christian. Okay, bro. That's it. But why it doesn't impact your life? Because you don't look at the life, the eternal life, what God has given. You don't take, take it so seriously. You don't appreciate or you don't have the thankfulness for what the Lord has done on the cross. It costed everything for God to sacrifice his son so that you and me can have a relationship with him. So if we lose that gratitude towards him for what he has done, I'm sure nobody will die for you. But 
God died for you and me so that we can have a relationship with him. And when we don't have that appreciation of what a great salvation we have received, then we are not going to be thankful to God. When you don't have the thankfulness towards God, then you are not going to be thankful to others also. So I want to challenge you. This 2017, will you make an effort to be thankful to God and to others? Will you be able to find something to thank God for your life first? There are many things you can be thankful to God. There are one billion people are homeless in this planet Earth on this day. One billion people. Out of seven billion, one believe it, one in seven people are without a home. We all have got a home. Out of seven billion people, one in three person going to go to bed this night without food. Some of us will go to home, we'll go home, we may not eat tonight. Maybe you had a very heavy lunch in this afternoon so that, you know, maybe you had lunch and then you slept, so that's why you can't eat in the night. We have got an indigestion problem, not a hunger problem. There are so many things. You are not in the hospital. You know, God has given us such a good health. When was the last time you have taken time to say thank you? Yeah, we are, we acknowledge, yes, ah, yeah, yeah, that's all because of God. But have you verbalized, have you said to God, God, I want to thank you. This is the air that I breathe. The life what I live, it's all because of you. So I want to thank you. Have you got that attitude? I want you to cultivate that habit. You know, when we go to a shopping complex or when you go to somebody's office, when somebody opens the door, we say thank you. But how much more God deserves thanks from us? How much more? You look at the Psalms. Read, go home and read Psalm 9. Psalm 30, Psalm 136. There are so numerous Psalms about thanking God always. I will praise the Lord continually. I will thank Him for His mercies. In Psalm 136, it talks about His mercy endures forever. There are 26 verses. Every verse as God says, His mercy endures forever. What a wonderful God we have. I... I ask you, my dear brothers and sisters, let's cultivate the habit of being thankfulness towards God. Let this 2017 be a year of thankfulness, be a year of gratitude towards what God has done for you and me, so that you and me will be able to live in peace with God and peace with others. As this word says in Colossians 3.15 says, let the peace of God Dwell in your hearts that you have been called to be as part of one body. Be thankfulness. I'm going to pause for a moment. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. Take a moment and say thank you for whatever God has done in your life. So that you will be able to be thankful towards him for what he has done or what he is doing or what he will continue to do. <music>